Thanks for joining us on lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramaniam. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines. It's a choppy start to the week with the Sensex and the Nifty oscillating between gains and losses. Small and mid caps underperform. HDFC reports strong set of numbers for the fourth quarter. Profit rises more than 20%. Asset quality remains steady. Vehicle sales fell further in the month of April, shows Siam data. The auto body says new emission norms and the resultant price hike will hurt small car sales the most. Etihad makes an offer for Jet Airways but lays onus on lenders to find an Indian partner which will pump in more funds. All right, let's first take a look at how markets are faring. Yatin is here with us. Uh, good afternoon, Ira. And uh, you know, something like last week, uh, the kind of selling that we saw uh, from institutional investors, uh, probably that is continuing this week as well. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the market, so we're almost down 30 points on the Nifty. Uh, you know, uh, very narrow range is what we have uh, traded, uh, you know, at the start, start of the trading session, and that is continuing through lunch, uh, afternoon. Uh, as far as uh, uh, advanced decline ratio on the Nifty 50 stocks are concerned, we have only 15 stocks advancing to 35 declining, and a handful of stocks, including a few consumer names uh, like uh, you know Titan and uh, uh, Hindustan Lever, are uh, you know holding the markets higher, 1% up for both of these stocks. HDFC Limited, India's largest mortgage uh, lender, uh, that stock is up uh, in nearly one and a half percent after the reported a uh, decent set of quarterly earnings. Uh, they have just the stock has just come off the day's high, uh, but still holding higher, uh, being one of the top uh, gainers of Nifty at this point in time. What's not doing well is the likes of Aisha Motors. That stock is down 7%, uh, trading below that 20,000 mark. A whole host of brokerages did cut, uh, you know, the earnings estimates uh, for uh, Aisha Motors post, uh, you know, the quarterly earnings. Uh, earnings were in line with expectations, but probably the kind of auto slowdown and the management commentary that we are talking about that has led uh, to the stock uh, correcting further in trade today, uh, six and a half percent down as we speak. Yes Bank, India Bull Housing Finance, and IOC are the other stocks uh, on the Nifty 50, uh, which are uh, you know the top losers, four four and a half percent down for all of these names. Uh, what's active in trade is uh, SBI as well as Tata Steel. SBI continuing that momentum post the quarterly earnings. That stock is up half a percent. Tata Steel was down as much as 6%, has recovered uh, you know, the, the losses uh, at the start of the trade, but still lower after we had uh, the company calling off its uh, European uh, JV. Uh, because of that, the stock is looking slightly nervous. Nothing, thank you for that. Uh, in another indication of a slowdown in the Indian economy, industrial output grew at its slowest pace in three years in financial year 2019. The index of industrial production grew 3.6% compared to 4.42 a year ago. Additionally, consumer price inflation is expected to remain below RBI's 4% target for the ninth straight month in April. To discuss the pulls and pressures of the economy, we're joined by uh, Shogatha Bhattacharya, Chief Economist at the Axis Bank on the phone line. Shogatha, thank you so much for joining us. Let me begin with uh, industrial production. Uh, what to your mind are the pockets of concern? Is this, uh, is this signaling a deep-rooted slowdown? Well, I mean, uh, this is certainly slower than we had expected. I mean, uh, I think uh, both street consensus and our own access bank forecast uh, was about 1.2, 1.5, uh, as opposed to the low negative that we actually got. Um, looking at the constituents, because that's the only way that we can figure out. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we all uh, read the high frequency indicators, the automobile sales, the freight uh, movement, transportation, etc., the aviation, uh, uh, the aviation industry travel numbers, and, and we try to get a sense of what is going on. Uh, but it, just looking at the components in terms of the of the deep slowdown in the capital goods and also the very low numbers in the in the intermediate goods, which is a signal of the inputs that are getting prepared uh, for for oncoming production and production orders, uh, that's what uh, is a little disturbing. Uh, compared to this, uh, I, and, and and in association with with uh, the IIP numbers, the uh, slowdown in food prices also seems to suggest uh, that there is a problem with with rural demand, uh, which is likely, which is probably what is feeding in into the overall demand components of the underlying the IIP. Uh, Shivato, uh, if this is uh, you know brought on by what's happening in uh, the rural economy, uh, unless there is some corrective measure, would you suspect that it would uh, sustain the slowdown uh, aspect at least for the next three to six months? Um, two things. One, uh, I, I think, uh, by in, in in terms of the cobweb of the of the cyclical cyclicality of rural prices, we are beginning to see 
uh, uh, rural price formation at least. I'm not very sure of the demand, uh, but rural prices beginning to rise in many key crops. Uh, of course, I mean, yeah, much of that is a result of the, the supply problems uh, likely being created by the oncoming drought conditions uh, that you have seen in many parts of the country. Uh, but I have a feeling that uh, the normal cobweb of, of low production getting on to, you know, some, some increased uh, demand for, for durable commodities that is beginning to play on. So that's one. Secondly, I think uh, from an overall perspective, I think this does require policy action mm. uh, till the elections get over and the uncertainty about the new uh, government comes on, uh, it begins to recede. I mean, we get a picture. Uh, I, I think many of the other price and, and fiscal uh, uh, stimulus measures that might be required uh, would probably not be forthcoming in, in with, with, to, the, to the extent that might be required. Uh, so that leaves the owners of, of any stimulus, uh, and, and I think there is a need for a stimulus, uh, onto monetary policy, which uh, obviously will inform uh, the view of the members in the oncoming uh, uh, the monetary policy committee meeting. So, there's been a consistent contraction in, in capital goods. Uh, what does that indicate to you from an investment standpoint? Well, I mean, uh, so the, 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 the proximate reason for the, for the uh, deep negative capital goods growth number um, was machinery, and, and particularly printing machinery. Now, I'm not very really sure. I mean, there are other components as well. I mean, you know, two-wheelers, commercial vehicles, etc., uh, but the largest contribution that we saw from the from the press release uh, that comes out with the IIP uh, was for machinery and particularly printing machinery. Uh, what what this tells us is unclear. It's it's ambiguous as of now. I mean, you know, I mean, in election season, uh, you would have thought that printing machinery presses would have been working over time, but apparently, and and that would have led uh, to further orders. So maybe it's the case that uh, the printing machinery numbers, and, and this has been the second month with the, with, with the machinery and printing machinery uh, with, with low growth. Uh, but be that as it may, I think the larger numbers of, of uh, three-wheelers and commercial vehicles which count into the capital goods numbers, uh, that's a slowdown. Um, the good part about this is that the numbers that we are seeing on the purchasing managers index seem to suggest that new orders and new export orders are beginning to look up. It's very difficult to form a view at this point in time how much of this slowdown is due to uh, pushing back CapEx plans till after the elections, etc. Uh, but this certainly requires a significant amount of monitoring. Uh, Shogato, uh, two questions roll into one. Uh, so, uh, you know, if there is a demand issue, uh, it should continue to reflect on core inflation and core inflation data when it comes today uh, should be softer. And then, uh, as you suggested, uh, perhaps uh, the call for a 25 basis point cut uh, will go, grow stronger. Although I think your colleague Seva was on the channel earlier and he was saying, you know, well, what's the point of these rate cuts? They're not transmitting. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, so rate cuts are a signal. Um, and I think there will be some transmission that will happen because, I mean, we are seeing liquidity now beginning to become much less uh, restrictive now. Uh, so, and then going forward too, uh, I have a feeling that the Reserve Bank of India will commit to various channels of, of uh, liquidity injections. Uh, but that, even that, I mean, you know, I mean, even if uh, banks cut MCLR by 25, 30 basis points, which uh, at this point in time, we still need to see whether that will happen. Uh, but that still would be relatively inadequate. So I, I think uh, there will be other measures that will be required uh, to push credit in into some of these segments, which uh, the Reserve Bank of India, with their own, with their extensive databases, uh, would deem uh, that uh, that more credit needs to be given to SMEs or some some other segments, and that might actually require some some uh, micro prudential, macro prudential, regulatory measures, some risk weights. Uh, capital relaxations, etc., that will push credit into those sectors. And obviously, I mean, you know, one large source of credit, uh, non-bank credit, the non-bank financial companies, MBFCs, uh, that uh, we, we will wait and watch what uh, various policy authorities, including the Reserve Bank of India, uh, take the measures that they will take uh, to try to, to increase liquidity in, into NBFCs and thereby add another channel of pushing liquidity. Shogata, we leave it there. Many thanks indeed for joining us with your perspective, Shogata Bhattacharya from Thank Axis so Bank much. on uh, the broader economy. HDFC, meanwhile, has reported a good set of numbers for the fourth quarter. The mortgage lender has uh, also managed to keep asset quality relatively under check. Shafali is standing by with the details on HDFC.
Shifali. Uh, well, on the first card basis, the numbers look really strong for HDFC with net interest income growth of about 19% and profit growth of about 27%. They also saw very strong loan growth during the quarter of about 15% on a YY basis. What will be interesting to look for uh, when the management speaks to analysts is uh, that how much of this has been on account of the portfolio buyouts that they might have done uh, from some of the other smaller um, housing finance companies which are stressed uh, at the moment or how much market share they would have gained during the quarter. The gross NPS stand at about 1.18% versus 1.22%. So there's some improvement there. And even in both the portfolios, in the individual uh, NPS, there is a marginal inch up to, avoid, uh, to about 0.7% versus 0.68%. And in non-individual NPS, there's actually a small improvement to about 2.34% versus 2.4%. 6% on a sequential basis. Margins, however, have declined on a sequential basis to about 3.3%. So there's a 20 basis points contraction in the margins. Spreads look more or less stable. And they've made a provisioning of about 935 crore rupees in the quarter, which looks on the higher side. And the management is saying that that's primarily on the back of um, a re or a restating of the numbers as per NDS. So numbers look more or less uh, steady. A bit more word on how the developer loan book has panned out during the quarter. That will be a bit more helpful in analyzing the numbers much more uh, deeply. All right, Tasha Fali, thanks so much for that. Uh, ITC will be reporting its fourth quarter numbers today. Our growth outside the cigarette business is likely to be subdued. Uh, the demand slowdown that affected other consumption firms is expected to weigh on ITC as well. Uh, Agam Vakil is standing by to tell us what the street is expecting. Agam. Well, uh, there are about three numbers that everyone's going to focus on. Firstly, the top line, we're expecting nearly 12% growth year on year. Uh, margins are expected to expand by as much as 170 basis points to around 38.7%. And profitability likely uh, could rise uh, just in tandem with uh, the EBIT. Now, uh, while the company does not report cigarette volumes, uh, uh, the street is estimating a volumes growth of around 7%, uh, which should be flat on a quarter on quarter basis. But but it may still be a positive, should we see uh, those expectations uh, come through. Uh, secondly, perhaps more importantly, uh, all eyes will be on the uh, FMCG business, excluding cigarettes, considering uh, we have seen a little bit of a slowdown and a moderation in volumes for a lot of ITC spheres as well already in the fourth quarter. Uh, while we can expect uh, str some strength to uh, will, will continue when it comes to the hotel business and paper business, agribusiness, on the other hand, is expecting to see some weak and finally, when it comes to uh, well, input costs, that we will be another key watchable, considering uh, it will have implications on gross margins and therefore operating margins as well. But on the whole, we're expecting a steady quarter from ITC. Okay, thank you for that. Etihad may have made a bid to Jet Airways, but the offer to, is to maintain the stake at 24%. The Middle Eastern airline has left it to the lenders to find another investor who's going to pump in a larger chunk of the capital to revive the airline. Vishwanath now joins us with more details on this one. Vishwanath. Right, Harsha. So, uh, as you said, uh, the offer that uh, Etihad has made is essentially to say that it is going to continue maintaining that 24% stake. Now, as and when the lenders find a new bidder and that bidder takes over majority equity in the company, then the existing shareholders of the company, that is Etihad as well as Naresh Goyal, will see some dilution. So, Etihad has said, just to cover that dilution, we will invest some portion uh, of, the, of the funds required for Jet Airways. However, the majority part of the fund infusion will have to depend on whoever this new buyer is. Now, remember that on Friday, when uh, the bidding process for Jet Airways actually got closed, Etihad was the only bid that came in. Uh, the other three shortlisted bidders, which included TPC Capital, uh, Indigo Partners, as well as uh, uh, NIIF, neither of them uh, had submitted their bids. But the lenders have received three unsolicited offers uh, from people who did not participate during the EUI process. Now, lenders have not decided what to do with those three EUI, uh, with those three uh, uh, unsolicited bids yet. Uh, they will take a call depending on whatever the lawyers advise them to do. But uh, suffices to say that the offer that has been given by Etihad is going to be something that the lenders are unlikely 
unlikely to accept uh, because it does not offer any kind of turnaround for the airline. It just says that we will infuse some money to hold our stake at 24%. Uh, so now it's up to the lenders to decide how exactly they're going to resolve Jet Airways. Uh, we've already seen uh, the process getting extended from uh, April till the 10th of May. Uh, and now when they have to think of ways out, uh, SBI and the other lenders will have to look for probably other new buyers or uh, go back to the three shortlisted bidders who did not submit their bids and probably convince them uh, to participate in the process again. All right, Vishnu, thanks so much for that. Uh, vehicle sales fell at their uh, sharpest pace in more than eight years in April. Siam posted uh, a 17% drop in uh, domestic vehicle sales, mainly led by a drop in car sales. Uh, and the industry body says there's more pain in store. Nishan Sharma spoke to uh, the Director General, Vishnu Mathur, uh, and uh, started off by asking him for his assessment on the impact of new emission norms on sales. All the uh, various reasons uh, which are contributing to a poor sentiment today, mm -hmm. we are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. We are seeing that the inventory correction process will finish in the next one or two months. A stable government will emerge. Uh, hopefully, government should find some kind of a solution to the NBFC crunch that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. So, these are some of the main reasons uh, why you know this uh, this poor sentiment is happening mm -hmm. so as we go along and then and then we, we we are also getting into a situation where next year there will be a change in emission norms right so before the emission norm changes there is usually a pre buy that happens mm -hmm. and that pre buy should begin sometime in the second mm -hmm. half of the year right so, yeah. you know talking about the emission norms how much of you know increase in pricing for passenger vehicles and two wheelers uh, you will see uh, when the norm kicks in See, definitely there will be an increase in cost. Mm -hmm. And the increase in cost is going to be more on small diesel cars. And you are hearing, hearing that many companies mm -hmm. are going to even uh, stop uh, making diesel, diesel, cars. diesel small cars mm -hmm. after a certain date. Uh, but there will be definitely a price increase. Uh, how much the price increase will be is mm -hmm. a matter for each company to decide because okay. uh, you know this, these are all company-related matters. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some companies will be able to absorb some pricing, some, some additional mm -hmm. cost and maybe resort to a lesser price increase. Mm -hmm. Some companies may not be able to do that. So this is a competitive issue. Mm -hmm. But definitely there will be a price increase. Right, and you have also requested for a GST rate cut. How much of a role or you know, sort of a breather uh, will give it both to the companies and to the consumers as well? See, basically what we are saying is that it's not just the emission norm that is going to increase the cost. Mm -hmm. There will be new safety norms coming. And those new safety norms are mandatory which will result in additional equipment being put into the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we go to emission uh, to BS6, those emission norms will require more components to be put, additional systems to be put into the vehicle, which is going to increase the cost. Mm -hmm. So this is, we believe, this is the right opportunity for the government to also participate in uh, the entire process of increased mm -hmm. safety, improved safety and improved mm -hmm. emissions on the road by reducing the overall GST rate so that a part of the increase Mm -hmm. in the cost that we will see is taken care of by a reduced GST. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that way we will be able to keep the vehicles affordable mm -hmm. and not increase the cost of the vehicles to you know, prohibitive levels mm -hmm. and ensure that the growth of the industry continues because this industry contributes hugely to employment generation. It is almost 50% of the manufacturing GDP of the country and it is not a good idea to let this industry uh, mm -hmm. suffer uh, mm -hmm. in terms of such steep uh, degrowth mm -hmm. which is ultimately going to impact on economy mm -hmm the GDP as also as the employment in the country. Right, you know, and I know it's difficult for you to give me a percentage advice, but what is your assessment in terms of your research that you have looked in? What kind of percentage hike we'll see in the passenger cars, 10 to 5 percent? What, 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 what are your readings there? No, as I said, the percentage increase is depending on the company. Mm -hmm. The cost the increase, the cost, no, there is nothing called average in this. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say 10 percent, 15 percent, but then some, some companies may say that's absolutely wrong. Okay. So there is no averaging you can do. Mm -hmm. And in terms of pricing, Siam as an organization does not collect any data on pricing. Okay. Neither on costings. Right. So right. we will not have... Uh, mm -hmm. th these are independent company uh, information. They will uh, be able to share it with you if they want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and increase in price today, in today's world of high competition, has mm -hmm. nothing really directly to do with cost of cost increase. Right, right. And you know, two last quick questions. Are you also seeing, you know, there, there have been reports of layoffs of contractual labors. Uh, do you think there's layoff happening given that, you know? We have not heard of any such reports for the time being. 
and if the if the industry continues like this for the next one or two years definitely there could be a possibility but as of now we do not have any reports of any layoffs happening in the industry right and and, and what what what's happening at the two wheeler especially in the scooter segment we saw 25% decline uh, for the april uh, when do you see the recovery happening and what is leading to that no i think i've already answered that question in fact it's not just the scooters which is minus 25 motorcycles is also around the same around right. minus 25 right so as i said it's a part of discretionary purchases mm -hmm. and uh, in the case of specifically in two wheelers mm -hmm. the insurance cost has gone up uh, quite significantly because this now you are required to buy insurance at the time of buying the vehicle mm -hmm. this is a five year insurance so uh, there is a, f a significant impact in cost and that is not a cost that the company can uh, you know absorb yeah, yeah. it has to be because it's an insurance cost mm -hmm. so uh, it's something that will uh, have to be accepted by the consumer over a period of time and uh, we will definitely see that as we go along uh, people will accept because high costs are always acceptable over a period of time right. but for a short term it results in disruption in sales that's a view of sam real estate companies have not yet defaulted on any repayments but some of them are said to be under financial strain for some time now this leaves mutual funds on a, on a sticky wicket especially the ones that have a sizable exposure to some of the stressed developers sajit has collated some data on on the mutual fund exposure to the real estate space joins us now to tell us how significant this is that's right you know uh, we've seen that uh, real estate ex uh, companies have been facing some financial crunch mm. uh, and uh, especially with respect to uh, uh, loans which have been taken from nbfcs uh, where they have uh, you know in many cases they have been restructured or uh, you know they have defaulted there uh, so we'll try to figure out over how much of uh, mutual funds have exposure to real estate and according to data by morning star it's uh, the data is uh, you know little surprising in that sense because uh, nearly uh, the total exposure of mutual funds to real estate is only 2% of the total asset mm. under management of income and liquid schemes uh, now there is uh, the total uh, aum for those is 10.89 lakh crores and the mutual fund exposure is only 21000 odd crores which is there uh, if you go and go go a step below and break it down further you know, you'll figure out uh, that uh, a maximum number of exposures uh, for some of the fund houses is in uh, in uh, fund houses like franklin which has nearly 5000 odd crores or icc prudential reliance nippon uh, aditya birla kotak these are some of the amcs which have significant exposure the top 5 uh, amcs uh, account for nearly 83% of that exposure there uh, but uh, of the 177 schemes which uh, have exposure to real estate over 60 odd schemes have more than 10% exposure uh, to real estate in their uh, schemes there and uh, if you look go even further down to see the kind of exposure they have on the corporate level uh, you know it's, it looks like they pretty much secured in their exposure because many of the uh, uh, you know groups which have exposure are very marquee groups like the tata group which has nearly 23% of that exposure of 21000 crores uh, which have uh, in terms of ncds which have been issued uh, followed by shapuji palan palanji or piramal these are the groups uh, who have uh, issued ncds and uh, and are been subscribed by the mutual fund so uh, uh, from a holistic point of view it doesn't seem like that there is uh, going to be any stress immediately coming on mutual funds at least from the real estate part of it all right sir thanks so much for that uh, that's a wrap on this edition of power lunch thanks so much for watching lots more coming up